<clears throat> so we have some really great topics coming up. Our most popular training is um, grant writing. And this is going to be a two hour version of our Volunteer West Virginia training and it's completely free. This one is really well received. Last year we had over 200 people sign up. So you're not going to want to miss out. And then our rest of our topics for the year, we're going to talk about AmeriCorps as a career stepping stone in November. And then we're going to close out this year with a party in December. So if you haven't registered yet, be sure to visit our website so you can get it on your calendar. So I want to introduce that September is National Preparedness Month, and we're so glad that all of you joined in today to learn simple and easy ways to get prepared for disasters. So how today's webinar is going to work, we're going to do three components. We're going to start out with a preparedness quiz. No stress, it's not graded, just to see how prepared you are in your home. And then I'm gonna introduce Gina and she's gonna be talking about four steps to get prepared. And then we have another special guest, Tim, and he's gonna be talking a little bit about flood preparedness. We chose this topic because it's such an important issue for West Virginia. So that's how we'll be rounding out the second half of our hour. So as we get started, we're gonna see how prepared are you? We have a five question quiz. And just take a second and think about these and see how much you know about preparedness. All right, so I see some answers coming in. I want to tell everybody there is five questions on the poll. So if you can't see all five questions, you might have to scroll down a little bit. So we'll give you a few more moments to see how prepared you are, and then we're going to go over the answers. All right, we'll count down. Five, four, three, two, one. All right, get awesome. your final answers in. All right, so you all should be able to see the poll results now on your screen. So it looks like most of you learn how to turn off your utilities. And if you don't, don't feel bad. That's what I learned last month or last year for National Preparedness Month. So it's a quick and easy way to get prepared. And then it looks like about half of you have emergency supplies stored in your home. So that's really awesome to hear. Everyone's doing really well with smoke alarms. Good to know. And if you're working with clients in your community that don't have smoke alarms, the Red Cross is a really great resource. They have a smoke alarm campaign. So that's a nice way to get them installed in your home. And let's see, number four, this one's really interesting. I know I'm guilty of this, is having your emergency contacts written down on a piece of paper. So all year long, I've been learning my husband's phone number and I would say I know it almost. So <laughs> that's a good thing to do is write it down in case your phone was turned off during an emergency. And then lastly, it looks like 70% of you have a first aid kit in your supplies. So it looks like you all are well on your way to getting prepared and we're going to learn some more easy ways for you to get prepared today. So it's my honor to introduce Gina. She's going to be teaching us four steps to being prepared. I've worked with Gina the whole time I've been at Volunteer West Virginia and she's just such a wonderful person and expert in this field. So welcome Gina. Thank you Dana. Glad to be here. So um, why is it important to be prepared? Oh, Gina, you're muted. Okay. There you go. Okay. Um, because disasters don't announce themselves. Even if you do have a little bit of warning, you may not have enough time to prepare yourself. Next. Uh, secondly, our first responders are 
a limited resource. Uh, they are not going to be able to get to everybody at the same time. Um, they um, will have blocked roads. Maybe they can't get access to your location. And lastly, they're going to be addressing the most critical needs um, during that time. Thirdly, uh, critical services may be impacted during a disaster. Uh, utilities may be off. Um, uh, you, uh, it, roads and infrastructure may be damaged. You may not be able to get to your home because of a flooded road. Um, electricity or the power may be out, like during uh, the ratio when uh, almost uh, over a million uh, people were without power for a long time uh, in a very, very hot summer. So you want to think about how can you be prepared and to meet your basic needs uh, if those services were impacted. And lastly, natural disasters are an economic loss. They're costing billions of dollars with each decade here in the United States. Uh, that price tag keeps going up. So as you can see, anything can happen at any time. The best thing that you can do to prepare your home, your family, your loved ones, your pets, is to prepare yourself and protect them uh, before a disaster strikes. So four steps to being prepared. What are those? Be informed, make a plan, build a kit, and be involved. So the first step is to be informed. You wanna know about the hazards in your area. Think about your community. Do you live near a river or a creek that has a potential of flooding? Are you near a chemical industrial uh, complex where there could be a chemical leak or other hazards? Uh, or a tr are you near a train track where there could be a train derailment? And power outages, of course, we all experience those in severe storms. So these are some of the things you wanna keep in mind when preparing. Um, so how will you stay informed and keep informed during a disaster or before? Well, there's the common um, alerts uh, that go out over the radio and TV. Um, there are some, um, automatic uh, alerts like uh, reverse 911 land calls that that goes over landlines that's what i'm trying to say uh, emergency managers um, can use that system to do a robo call to landlines um, alerting people about an emergency for instance during the water crisis when we had contaminated water um, i got um, uh, an alert through my landline uh, if anyone has had an alert, just kind of type that into the chat box if you want to do that and uh, say how you've gotten alerted uh, from a local official. Um, some other things are that um, uh, managers, emergency managers are going uh, to social media. So you could follow them on Facebook or Twitter. Also, some have emergency apps that you can download. For instance, Kanawha County has an app called KC Ready. And that will um, send alerts to you about traffic uh, issues, accidents, weather-related disasters. Next. Um, FEMA has an app that you can download and you can receive up to uh, five location, different locations for weather alerts. It has a section that you can put your preparedness information and it has tips about being prepared. It also uh, has some other disaster resources. For instance, if you are looking for a local shelter nearby and you can upload your uh, photos if you had a uh, disaster damage uh, that you could upload and that would be ready to share with local first responders. Uh, another platform that uh, some emergency uh, management agencies will use is called Nixle. If you go to nixel.com and type in your uh, zip code, you can, it'll pull up the different um, agencies in your area that use that platform. 
But the best tip I'll say is if you contact your county emergency management office, in West Virginia, each county has one, and see what app or what mode of platform or social media do they use to alert their uh, residents. Oops. Sorry, Gina. It's okay. So we all are familiar with weather alerts, but what do they mean? So there's three types of alerts from less serious, which is an advisory, to a watch. That means it is uh, possible, but the timing and location is uncertain. So you need to keep track of weather updates and a warning, which is serious. That is something's happening now. It's imminent. You have to take action now to protect life, limb, or property. If you go to um, uh, the National Weather Service, they have great tips for each season of the year. This is a good way to get prepared. With each season, you can follow some of the tips that uh, uh, the Weather Service has. If, and uh, Christina will share that link um, in the chat box. So it's weather.gov slash safety campaign and um, check out the tips there for each season. So we'll, we'll probably go over, next slide, we'll go over a couple of tips uh, uh, that are weather related. Uh, you wanna prepare for extreme temperatures. Um, heat is the number one weather-related killer in the United States. You would think earthquakes, hurricanes, or something else, but no, heat is the number one killer. So you really need to be careful. Also, it isn't just the temperature that you're concerned about or should be honed into. It's the heat, what they call the heat index. So it maybe it's 88 degrees, you think mm, that's not too bad, but the heat index is it feels like, what it feels like. That and if it, so, listen for that and be careful. Um, stay indoors, obviously, if you can. If you have to work outdoors, take frequent breaks. Stay hydrated. Avoid caffeine. And if there happens to be wide power outages, whether it's in extreme heat or extreme cold, think about how you will um, cool off or warm up in those conditions. In the winter, if you have an alternative heating source, you're going to want to use that safe. Know how to use it. Vent your wood burning or gas heaters. And in the in the summer, maybe it's you need to go to the mall to cool off or go to a, a friend or family whose AC is still on. And remember to check on your vulnerable neighbors and family members. Some heat exhaust symptoms you want to be aware of is weakness, dizziness, a fast or weak pulse. If uh, you or someone uh, that you're with is feeling that way, don't hesitate but to call 911. Next. So uh, no matter what the severe weather, weather hazard is, um, you wanna just take some common sense steps, which is to stay indoors and bring your pets inside. And if it's high winds that uh, is a hazard during that storm, secure your outdoor objects, bring things into a garage if you can. All year round, keep your trees and shrubs trimmed so that they don't cause a hazard, and, you know, break off or uh, damage your car or property. Um, in high winds, stay away from glass windows and doors. Uh, you, If it's really, um, high level wind or severe um, uh, wind warning, you, you can take shelter in your basement or in an inner room with no windows, like a bathroom or a closet. And you wanna stay prepared uh, for any power outages. Next. So some power outage tips, you know, have your, know where your flashlight is. Have extra batteries on hand. Buy them and keep them in their own uh, original containers so they don't corrode. And, and keep them in a place that you know where they're going to be. 
Um, unplug your electronic equipment uh, to protect it from power sources. And how are you gonna keep your food safe? Well, you can keep food in the fridge up to four hours and in the freezer up to 48 hours safe. And you wanna have any backup plan for power dependent medical equipment that you have. If you don't know what that looks like, call the vendor or whoever provided your medical equipment and they can give you tips on what to do there. And if you have a gas power generator, it should be operated outside and away from the home and garage to be safe from any fumes. Next. And another important skill to know is to uh, learn how to shut off your utilities. Do you know where your utilities are in your house? Um, identify them and tag them. If you don't, you can call your utility company. They'll be glad to help you do that and to learn how to turn them off safely. Uh, you only do so, you know, local authorities have told you to. And then you share those instructions with uh, those members of your household. Step two is to make a plan. So how will you contact each other in case you're apart or during emergency? One of the tips they say is in case power, um, your phone lines may be down or they may be congested, it's better to text not to talk because uh, it, texting takes le less data. You'll wanna keep um, a sheet and information of all your important emergency contacts. Um, know where your designating meeting place is out of town. If you can't, if your home is damaged or you're flooded out and you can't get back home, d decide ahead of time, pre-identify where you and your family will meet. Maybe it's a friend or family from out of town. Also keep um, a list of your medications and allergies. Uh, have a, write down your medical contacts, your doctors, uh, pharmacy and school and work information that you might need. Maybe store all those phone numbers in your phone, but it's also good to be redundant and have it written down in one place. And um, in case of an emergency, one of the things uh, they uh, first responders uh, suggest is that folks keep an ICE contact in their phone, which means a case of emergency. And that's in case you're incapacitated and uh, uh, they can't communicate with you. They'll know who to contact. And you can start this uh, quick, easy list uh, by going to our website, ready.wv.gov, and download the family emergency plan form that we have. And um, thank you, Christina, for sharing that. We can go to the next slide. So um, some other documents that you may need um, during a disaster. These are financial and legal documents or something that you might need to have on hand in case your home or property was severely damaged and you would be, uh, you might need to request government assistance or insurance or assistance from your insurance providers. They may require you to provide this type of information. And so quickly, some we'll touch on some of those things, uh, like your housing, like a, your lease or a mortgage. Uh, you'd wanna have a copy of your uh, registration and card title. Um, some other documents might include financial obligations, such as your utility bills, credit card information, uh, financial accounts, such as your checking and savings and your retirement accounts. Um, insurance policies, that's really important. And you wanna have that information at hand. Uh, proof of income, um, sometimes uh, government as, uh, disaster assistance programs will wanna have that information. I'm sure Tim will know more about that with the flood assistance. Uh, and tax statements, your estate um, information, such as a copy of your will, medical uh, information, like we said, your list of medications, but like a living will or medical power of attorney, or if you have a disability, those types of documentations. 
Um, some other vital records that you might want to have a copy of or keep in one location um, or is your birth or marriage certificate, ID such as driver's license, passport, uh, pets. If you have pets, you want to have pet your ID tags, uh, maybe um, you know records of ownership, vaccination records. Uh, and really, it would be good to have a picture of yourself with your pet so that if something were to happen and you were separated, you could have that there. This is my pet. This is uh, uh, who, you know, if you lost your pet during a disaster. Uh, family mementos such as photos and keepsakes are things that you can't replace if they were damaged during a disaster. A tip is to scan those and have digital copies of those saved. So what do you do with all this important stuff? Where do you keep it? So you click it. Sorry. Give us a click, Christina. I'm sorry. There okay. you go. So you can store your hard copies in a fire or waterproof box or uh, or a home safe, or store them in a safe deposit box at the bank. You can also have digital copies of those things, which I think to me is a great idea uh, to have both. Uh, you could use a cloud-based service. There's plenty of free ones out there. I definitely want a password protected format. You can also keep it on a flash drive or external hard drive of some kind and keep that in your safe. Uh, box. And one more click, I believe, and your valuables. Maybe if you, you might think that those need a safer place uh, than your home if you have valuables. Maybe those need to be in a safe deposit box or in a safer location in your house, maybe not in your basement. And like I said, store your pictures electronically. And this checklist. Uh, is downloadable at the FEMA website. Christina's going to share those or already has uh, in the uh, chat box. And you can learn more about financial preparation uh, at ready.gov slash financial slash, or not slash, but hyphen preparedness. So it's got a lot of good information and explains why you might need those things. Um, so when you're making this plan and getting your things together, just keep in mind um, what you and your family will do. Do you know what you're going to do if you have to evacuate or if you have to shelter in place? And will you have the things that you need? Oops, can you back up? Okay. Okay, then I think we're ready. It just... So some of the things you might need is definitely food, wait a minute, I think for your food, a three-day minimum supply of uh, non-perishable food like peanut butter, crackers, canned foods. You want a gallon of water per person per day, including children, medications and medical equipment, pet supplies, if you have pets, baby supplies or other special needs. And I was want before we go further, what are some of the things if you want to put in the chat box, some of the things you might need in your kit? If people want to name some, maybe name some items that you have in your emergency kit if you have them, or something that you already have in your house that would be useful during an emergency. Okay, great. Flashlight, blanket, phone charger, absolutely. And an alternative phone charger, like a car charger. Great. So let's go on. You can click for me, Christina. Keep going. Flashlight and batteries, first aid. Oh. Solar powered radio. That's great. I see in the chat box. Um, paper goods like paper towels, plates, utensils, personal hygiene items, wipes, 
hand sanitizer. Keep a little cash if you're able, can opener for your canned goods. Uh, your mobile charger. And uh, there's your utility tool in case you have to turn your utilities off. Local maps in case your GPS is down. Uh, face masks and a whistle in case you are to get stranded somehow and people can't hear you. So when you're putting your uh, emergency kit together, think about other locations you might need a little emergency kit, such as your car, especially if you're traveling a lot, something at work, and make sure that your cold kit can serve as your to-go evacuation kit. You can keep all your supplies in a big duffel bag or a, like a plastic waterproof box and that way you can grab it and go if you need to or it will be there for you at home to shelter in place um, and you want to check those kits twice a year a good time to do that is uh, when you turn the clocks back in the spring and the fall and at the same time uh, you can also check your smoke alarms that's uh, really important to do because you may have them but really haven't checked them in years to make sure they're working make sure you don't need to change out those batteries next then here's some fun prep tips i don't know if anybody still uses crisco but if you have that in a little wick you've got an uh, automatic candle if you if the power's been out a while and you want, need to save your food you can fill your wash machine or bathtub with ice and put your food in there. And if you have batteries that don't work too small, uh, you can fill up the ends with aluminum foil and then voila, you have, uh, you've got uh, a bigger size battery. Go on. Some weather, winter weather prep tips, uh, you know, just go ahead and get that salt now before the first snow. Um, and when you're shoveling snow, you can use Pam to so that the snow will fall off the um, shovel easily. If you're stuck in the snow and you don't have any um, cat litter in your car, you can use your uh, mats to uh, uh, get more traction. And then if your car doors are stuck, um, sanitizer can help um, unfreeze those frozen door handles. Lastly, you want to become involved. You want to train and practice. Do a fire drill at home with your family. Do it at work. Uh, take a CPR or first aid training. Learn how to use a fire extinguisher. Do you have one in your home? It's a good idea to keep one in your kitchen. I burned my toast and set my uh, uh, toaster on fire two or three times. And that's been a challenge. And I had a fire extinguisher, but froze up because I didn't know how to use it. So it's a good idea. We've done that here at work. We've um, gone to the fire station. Your local fire department can teach you how to do that. It's a hands-on training. It's fun. And it'll give you confidence in how to use an extinguisher. Invite your local first responder to talk about safety. Um, to your neighborhood association, your faith-based group. Or, um, and then lastly, if you want to volunteer, um, check out the Red Cross. There's a link that you can um, see what volunteer opportunities they have for helping those after a disaster. And there's other disaster volunteer agencies uh, that you could affiliate with at uh, nvoad.org. So both of those links, uh, Christina will share with you. And lastly, you can get started on your journey by participating in Red Cross's workshops they're having next week. Uh, next week, Tuesday, Wednesday, and Thursday, uh, they have three workshops. Be Ready, Be Red Cross Ready is a general preparedness workshop, hands-only CPR, and then the last one will be a preparedness workshop for businesses and organizations. They're holding them twice a day at noon and at six. So I encourage you to register there 
and um, and take a class. Um, and that training link, that registration link is in the chat box. And then uh, another way, uh, resource that we have is if you go to ready.wv.gov and go to our personal prep toolkit, we'll help you get started. Everything's there, the family emergency plan, communication tips, and other tools that will help you get started because it really feels overwhelming when you think of all these things. So just take time uh, to do one thing at a time. If it's just one thing a month, um, when you shop, maybe get that extra peanut butter, crackers, a little extra something, those batteries, just, you know, make it easy on yourself, but at least take some steps toward being better prepared. Thanks, Gina. That was such an awesome presentation. There are so many good tips in there. And if you all want to share these tips with people you work with or your clients or neighbors, we'll be sending out a copy of this presentation and all the slides after the webinar today. Um, so you can have all those checklists and information that you need to have. So be on the lookout for that. And without much further ado, I'm really happy to introduce our next special guest, Tim. He's gonna be telling us about flood preparedness, which is such an important topic in West Virginia. I was talking to Tim before today's webinar and I learned that he has been in the flood preparedness and um, emergency service field for over 20 years in West Virginia. Um, he was born and raised in Lincoln County and graduated from Hamlin High School and a Century Career College with an associate degree in business management. After that, Tim started working for the Office of Emergency Management in 2001 as a contract worker in the National Flood Insurance Program. And then in 2003, he was hired on full time after the flooding in McDowell County. Um, Tim has held a variety of positions in the field. He became the State Hazard Mitigation Officer in 2009 for West Virginia. And then after a few years and working in that, he um, went back to the flood insurance program. And right now, Tim leads the local permit officers on floodplain management issues for the state. And I also learned that Tim had a birthday on Monday. So I'm really happy to introduce Tim. He's an expert in the field and he's gonna be sharing some tips on flood preparedness for us. So welcome, Tim. Thank you, Dana. So working in emergency management over the years, I've learned a lot about why we should be prepared and how we should be prepared. So I'm just gonna give you some help, helpful hints today. As Gina just did, all of those were really great hints or great things that you can do to pre be, pre be prepared should any type of a hazard event occur. Floods are among the highest uh, hazard we have in the state of West Virginia. And as everybody knows, it doesn't take a whole lot of rain for us to flood. Flash flooding means that there is a flood or an intimate flat, uh, threat of flooding that's going to occur. When you get a warning, you should take immediate action, which means you should have that preparedness kit ready, throw it in your vehicle, and if it's on your stream or near you, move to higher ground. And having an emergency preparedness kit is always a good thing to have. We have multiple hazards. We never know when there's going to be a chemical plant spill. We have to shelter in place. We can't go anywhere, whether it's a flooding event, whether we're having another derecho like we had in 2012. I mean, there's so many hazards that we have to deal with here in West Virginia. Another important thing is, is if you have electricity, always tune into your local news. In your community, you should always have good contacts with your emergency management professionals. Um, get on their websites, get on their email addresses, um, so that if there is an intimate threat, they can contact you uh, individually. Um, and then make sure that your family members are also aware of what's going on. 
You can always download the emergency app for your iPhone um, that will keep you informed of what's happening at that time. How to be prepared, how to prepare before a flood. So protecting your family is the most important thing that we can do. Your home can be replaced, your family cannot. So talk to your family about what to do if a flood watch or a warning is issued. If a flood watch is issued, it doesn't mean that there's an intimate threat of a flood. It means that you should be getting prepared in case there is an intimate threat of flood. A flood warning means it could be occurring already and you should have your you should be prepared and ready to go or to seek higher ground if you need to. Find out if you're in a floodplain. How many of you have used the West Virginia flood tool to determine whether or not you are in a special flood hazard area? I can say if you live close to a stream, whether you're on that map as being in a floodplain or not, you still have a threat. Purchase battery. Gina went over a lot of this stuff. So purchase a battery powered or crank radio. You should always keep tuned in to the national weather or your local emergency management agency. I can tell you that the state is briefed on weather events nearly every day. Well, I can tell you my office is every morning at 10 a.m. Uh, we have a briefing with the national weather. Whether there's anything coming or not, we still have that call and keep all your important documents. And I recommend you, you keep these in a, a waterproof container um, or at your local bank. Protecting your home, make sure everything is elevated above where that flood could be. So if you have a basement, basements are never good in a floodplain, um, move your stuff up. Your basement should not be used as a, li as a living space anyway. If you're in a special flood hazard area, that is a violation to the code. Put all your good stuff above the flood stuff. And another thing I want to mention here is even your outdoor stuff. If you're close to a stream, never store anything close to that stream because during a flooding event, it becomes debris. Debris causes stream blockages, especially if you have a bridge or a culvert downstream from you. If that was to get blocked, you're going to cause additional flooding on all your neighbors. Another thing to do, and if you're in a floodplain, you should have already done, is you make sure your furnace, your hot water tank, your electrical panels, and everything is above where that flood water could be. So this stuff shouldn't be in a basement. It shouldn't be sitting on the ground. It should be elevated above wherever that height is that the flood could be. Listen to your local news. NOAA is always on our, you know, they keep us covered. They let us know. They usually give us days of advance warning. So if national weather is saying, oh, look what we have coming for, that's the time to start preparing. Don't wait until it hits. Um, be prepared to evacuate quickly because we're having flash floods now. And I can tell you in the last month and a half, Numerous communities have been impacted by flash floods. Little warning time, little preparedness time. You have to always be prepared and be ready. Always check your emergency kit to see if there's fresh batteries or if there's anything that needs to be tossed out and replaced so that you're ready should that flood or that hazard occur. Should a flood occur, fill plastic bottles with clean water for drinking. Fill your bathtubs with water so that you can use them to flush your toilets or anything else that you might need water for other than drinking. You don't want to drink the water out of your bathtub. Keep your car at least a half tank full, if not all the way full. I know many of us, you know, we can't keep it full all the time, but you should never let your vehicle go below a half a tank or even a quarter a tank, so that you're always prepared to jump in the vehicle and head out. Bring outdoor belongings such as patio furniture, indoors, and any other thing that could float during a flooding event. I know a lot of us have sheds and 
from driving around the state. Many of us are putting our, our animals, our dog boxes down by the stream so we don't have to carry water to them. That's not a good plan. That's not a good idea. If you're that lazy, you may not should have a pet, you know. After propane tanks, I can tell you propane tanks became becomes bombs during a flooding event. If a propane tank was to float away and hit a bridge, it could explode and destroy the bridge. Propane tanks, according to regulations, are to be anchored if it's in the special flood hazard area. If you still have time, move your furniture and all your valuables to higher floors of your home. Again, especially if you have a basement, which, you know, basements are allowed in pre-firm. And what I mean by pre-firm is built before the flood insurance rate maps were developed for your community. Be sure to turn off all your utilities. There's usually one switch in your breaker box that can turn off everything in your home. Know where that switch is. And if you switch, turn that switch off, you don't have to worry about your small appliances or anything else because that one switch will turn off everything in your home. If you have pets or livestock, again, especially if they're chained up by the stream, at least turn them loose. Um, move them away from where the hazard is occurring. You may want to send your livestock if you have cattle or horses or outdoor animals of that sort. Put them in a fencing area that's higher up, away from the storm or away from the flood. Bring all your companion animals indoors, and if you was to leave to evacuate, take them with you. And you may also need to have an emergency pet kit, similar to the kit for yourself. Just make sure they have the food and any medicines that they may need while you're gone. Let your family, this is a biggie, let your family know you are safe. When events like this occur, everybody worries about everybody. So, and sometimes if you call the home number and it's not a cell number, they're not going to get you because you're not home. And that even makes them worry more. So let your family know what your evacuation plan is, where you plan to go, a phone number that you can be reached at, and do all this prior to the event. Purchase flood insurance. If you are in or even close to a special flood hazard area as depicted on the flood insurance rate map, I can tell you that line on the flood insurance rate map does not mean you're gonna be dry on one side and wet on the other. It means that that's the regulatory floodplain for FEMA and the mandatory purchase requirements for bankers. Disaster assistance will only pay you if, you're, if you have a $150,000 home that is washed away. The most FEMA can pay you for that home if it's destroyed is $37,500. Why is it important to carry flood insurance? Because flood insurance, if you insure yourself for the market value, flood insurance will make you whole. Disaster assistance was never made to make you whole. It was to make you get back to a livable condition, whatever you consider a, condi a livable condition. It's usually not gonna be enough if it's disaster assistance. Why flood insurance is so important? 40% of structures located outside that line on that flood insurance rate map flood. I actually think that statistic is even higher. Flood insurance is the only way that you will be made whole. And I can tell you, if you insure yourself for the market value, you don't get depreciated value. If you don't insure yourself for the market value or less than 80% of the market value, you will get depreciated value on anything that's destroyed during that flooding event. You can purchase a national flood insurance policy from any insurance agent, um, usually wherever you have your homeowner's policy or even your auto policy. And if you don't know and you're interested, call them up and ask them for a quote. It takes 20 minutes to get a quote for flood insurance. 
from your local insurance agent. So if you don't know whether you're in a floodplain or not, we have this one of the best tools I think in this in the country, the West Virginia flood tool. So you can go to mapwv.gov slash flood. Click yes on the disclaimer and enter your address in the top search engine. Just enter your address, whatever it may be, city, state. You don't even have to use the zip most of the time and hit the enter button on your computer. It will pull up your house with an aerial photograph photo. Um, and if there's any red, you're in a special flood hazard area and you could flood at any time during a flooding event. That's the first thing you're gonna see whenever you open the West Virginia flood tool. So you wanna launch the map. And then the next thing is gonna be your disclaimer and you just wanna click on your disclaimer and then enter your address. So to learn more about emergency preparedness and other actions to take uh, for you and your loved ones, visit the website, Gina, I think this was the CRs, Ready West Virginia, ready West Virginia .gov. Be informed, make a plan, make a kit, be involved. And I hope what I have told you today will help you be prepared should any hazard occur. Thank you. Thank you, Tim. That was an awesome presentation. I was just checking out the flood map while you're speaking, and it's really interesting to see where the floodplain is. And those are really very nice, tangible tips. So we really appreciate it. And I loved your commercial for Ready WV. Maybe you and Gina could partner and do an advertising campaign. I don't know. But if anyone has any questions before we wrap up, you can put them in the chat box. If you want to ask um, Tim a question or Gina a question, we have a few minutes. So that would be a really great time to do so. And then as you think of your questions for the chat box, I'm gonna do a few final reminders for us today. Um, be sure to complete the feedback survey. Christina is gonna paste that in the chat box. We'd love to hear what you think about today's webinar. And this would be an opportunity for you to, to suggest topics for future webinars. I can't believe this year is almost flown by. So Christina and I are gonna be making the schedule for next year soon. So if there's something you'd love to learn about, be sure to put it in that survey and then register for our upcoming webinars. Like I mentioned in the beginning, we have our grant writing webinar coming up in October. You're not gonna to wanna to miss that. We're gonna have Nikki from the Grant Advantage teaching that for us. And then we'll have an AmeriCorps as a career stepping stone and a holiday party at the end of the year. And then as always, follow us on social media to hear what we're up to. So. I don't see any questions in the chat box. We'll give it just a moment and I'll play a closing song for us. And I just wanted to thank Gina and Tim again for being our guests today. 